Oh, I just finished filming and then watched the film back and realised that I had mascara all over my little eyelid. I'm not refilming at all, so sorry if it's distracting, but it's fashion, darling. Look it up. Picture the scene, POV. You're in high school biology class learning about chromosomes. Your teacher tells you that we all have two sex chromosomes, a combination of X and Y. An XX combo makes you a woman, an XY combo makes you a man. Maybe like me, you come up with some great way of remembering this, like boy with a Y or XOXO gossip girl. Sorted, you now know a key tenet of biology. Except you don't because it's more complicated than that. Good morning everyone, I'm Soph, these are my notes, and it's time to dip our collective tic-tac-toes into the complex science of sex, and why trying to fit everyone into two boxes can cause problems. Have you ever experienced that thing before where the more in depth you study something, the more you realise that what you learnt before wasn't quite right? It's not that your teachers out and out lied, it's just that they simplified stuff for the level that was appropriate for you passing your exams. It's like those videos where someone explains something to people of like five different levels, from like five years old right up to a professor. You learnt stuff at a level in between there. So in chemistry, you first learn that electrons go around the nucleus of an atom in these things called shells. But then later on you learn that actually electrons are more sort of vaguely contained within these clouds called orbitals. And then you probably learn something different, but that's as far as I got. Or think about a subject like history. You probably learn less about the geopolitical causes of World War II when you're 16 than you would if you did it as a uni degree or beyond. But the thing with biology is that it feels like it should be different because it's us. We know who we are. We know how we work. It's not up for interpretation like historical sources or impossible to see with the naked eye like atoms. It is your naked eye. You are the subject matter, as is everyone around you. But just because we are human doesn't mean we are each human biology experts. And although we may see lots of things around us that fit the simple rules we learn in school, those rules were just that. Simple. They've been simplified for a particular level of learning, and so there are lots of examples that don't fit them. I see the phrase basic biology being thrown around quite a lot. But biology is far from that. Learning the basic version of something doesn't mean it's the true version of things. And as a human, you should give yourself more credit. You're not basic at all. You're complicated. But of course, it's easy to believe the basic version of things when everything we see around us seems to match to it. So let's talk about some examples where things don't. Pause. Okay. In this video, I'm going to be covering the relationship between chromosomes and bodily processes in anatomy. In other words, I'm looking at sex from a genetic and physical or physiologic point of view. I'm not going to get into gender identity and how that links to everything because I think that's a really important topic that I want to give my full focus to in another video. So that means it's beyond the scope of what I'm covering here. Just wanted to give you the heads up if you wonder why I don't mention it much. So first off, XX and XY aren't the only possible combinations of sex chromosomes. Some people are on an inherit to get one free deal. That means they have an extra one having XXY, XYY or XXX. I'm not going to go into detail on each of these because I'm talking a lot <laughs> during this video and giving a lot of examples, but importantly, all three of these combinations, despite seeming like quite a dramatic shift from the norm, often go by completely unnoticed. Many people who have a whole extra sex chromosome have no idea that's the case. Then there are people who go the other way and only have one sex chromosome, a single X. This is known as Turner syndrome and the symptoms are more severe. This means it's often either diagnosed at birth due to heart problems, swollen feet and hands or an unusually wide neck, or at puberty when someone fails to develop normally. So pretty big chromosomal shifts can happen. And that's just the start of variation. It's your genes, including genes on your sex chromosomes, that are what trigger sexual development. And there are loads of different ones involved. Because there are loads of different genes involved, there are loads of different places where things can deviate from the classic route. Edit Sophie here so I can say this bit clearer than I originally did. So as an embryo, you have the ability to physically develop either down the male line or down the female line, or somewhere in between, which we'll get onto in a minute. But this means we have various anatomical bits that can go either way, that can swing both ways, if you will. So for example, 
You've got the gonadal ridges, they can become ovaries or testes. You've got your labioscrotal swellings, and as the name suggests, these can become the labia or the scrotum. You've got your genital tubercle that can become the clit or the penis. And there are some ducts that can I, not ducts, like quack ducts, <laughs> like ducts, <laughs> that can become either the uterus and fallopian tubes or the male plumbing, which is like the epididymis and the vas deferens. I find that an incredibly efficient use of space. <laughs> It's like it was designed by a German. Now the route that each of these parts go down is controlled by your genes which trigger a complex set of downstream effects via interactions of proteins and hormones and receptors, a lot of different moving parts. But this isn't always plain sailing, it's a complex multi-step process meaning there are multiple steps where things can deviate from the norm and therefore where the male-female binary can start to get mucked about with. Let's have a look at a few examples where this happens. CAH or congenital adrenal hyperplasia is basically caused by too little cortisol and too many androgens in the body. Androgens are the hormones associated with the development of masculine sexual characteristics, so an example of one is testosterone. Symptoms of CAH vary depending on severity, but in XX individuals it can lead to ambiguous genitals, so that's like a large clit infused labia, more facial and body hair, irregular periods and fertility problems, but some people with it show no symptoms at all. So if CAH is caused by too many androgens, then we've got AIS, or androgen insensitivity syndrome, which is caused by your body not responding to them. So the androgens are there, but your body's just like, no. More severe cases are known as CAIS, or complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. People with AIS may be genetically XY, so genetically male, have internally male genitals, like undescended testes, but external female genitals, like a vulva and vagina, but no uterus. So they look female and often identify as such, but they have a Y chromosome and are internally male. One famous example of someone with AIS is Wallace Simpson. Now, if you don't know who that is, she's the one that King Edward, or Queen Elizabeth's uncle, gave up the throne for. If you still don't know who she is, because I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't watched The Crown, then she's this one in The Crown. With Wallace Simpson, this case isn't actually fully confirmed. It's, it's a conclusion that's been come to by historians and biographers using evidence from when she was alive. And if you still don't know who she is, then it's also thought that Joan of Arc may have had AIS too. Joan of Arc's probably a bit more famous, but that case isn't confirmed. Hey, fancy another one? Yes, I do, Davina. There's this enzyme, okay and it's called 5-alpha reductase. Children who are born genetically male, so XY, but lack this one little enzyme, have generally female appearing genitals when they're born, and they're often raised as girls. Then puberty comes along, their clit develops into a penis, and their testes descend, making them physiologically male. And this is all because that missing enzyme is key in the early development of male genitals. This syndrome is perhaps best known through studies in the Dominican Republic, where these people are known as guevedoches. Huevedoches, excuse my pronunciation. In English, we colloquially call it testes at 12. Those are a few examples, and there's one more I'm going to mention because I've seen that argument in a few places that you can still define people based on which gamete or sex cell their physiology is generally based around, the sperm or the egg. But mutations in various different genes can lead to the development of something called an ovotestis, which is a gonad that has both ovarian and testicular tissue. Your gonads are typically your ovaries or your testes, so this is a gonad that's a mix of the two. So therefore, these people have tissues associated with both sex cells, testes for sperm and ovaries for eggs, so what category would they be put in? Even though I've spoken for a wee while on this, these are just still some examples. I cut several out, but there are loads more because there are loads more genes and molecules involved in sex development that can be affected. And so there's lots more biological possibilities. The word that's often used to describe people whose sex characteristics differ from what's typically associated with being male or female is intersex science word intersex although i say that but the more sort of scientific phrase that's been coined is dsds which stands for differences or disorders of sexual development depending where you look now i've always associated intersex as being quite a human word i've read about the intersex community so seeing the use of dsds felt a little bit cold to me i guess um, and i've seen a few intersex people argue against the use of disorders especially as it suggests that there's something wrong with them when really they just don't fit a binary but we'll get onto that more in a very short minute. It is worth noting that what counts as intersex can have different definitions. So for example, some people don't include those major sex chromosome changes that I talked about at the start, like, like XYY, XYY, or XYY. <laughs> 
something like XXY, XYY or XO. But even if we use the more specific definitions of intersex, it's still a term that is a massive umbrella. It covers a huge variable range of experiences and physicalities. And so what it does show us is that sex is not as simple as we've been taught and as scientists thought a while ago. When something is binary, it means you have two options, zero or one off or on, man or woman. But all these examples have shown that there are loads of cases where people don't clearly align to either side of the sex binary. And that's even without mentioning the psychological and sociological aspects of gender. So seeing as not everyone matches the binary, it makes sense to think of sex as a spectrum with variation between the two sides. Now, sex is a spectrum is a phrase that anyone who's been to the queer night, big dyke energy is probably familiar with. Um, so if that's you, feel free to roll your eyes at me and say, well, obviously, and I'll see you at the next one. But for a lot of people who learnt biology, well, the way that it was taught, it can be a confusing idea. It's like being told something that you thought was a key foundation stone of yourself and the people around you is a lie. It's like that because it is that, as the stories and examples I've spoken about today have shown. So why is it a problem to impose a binary on something that isn't so simple, that's more of a spectrum? Let me tell you. Maria Tridus is an intersex person I saw in a video from Anthony Padilla, which I highly recommend giving a watch. They have androgen insensitivity syndrome, which is one of the conditions that I mentioned earlier. Maria wasn't told they were intersex until the age of 18, despite having two surgeries before then. One at two years old to remove gonadal streaks inside of them, and one at 12 for cosmetic reasons. Maria still doesn't know exactly what happened during these surgeries. They don't know what happened to their own body. This story and the idea of being kept in the dark by your own body is something that many intersex people will find eerily familiar. I've mentioned ambiguous genitals a couple of times in this video and it's a side effect of various intersex conditions. When a child is born with genitals that aren't clearly male or female, there's a risk that doctors will recommend that they undergo surgery to make them look more one way or the other, so that they can be grouped into one of those binary camps. This often happens while the intersex person is still an infant, with no choice in the matter, under the guise of doing what's best for them. These posters for Intersex Awareness Day aim to highlight the prevalence of such forced surgeries on infants and children. Kids who had these surgeries had no say in how their body was going to look, and they grow into adults whose intersexuality is either kept a secret from them or who are led to believe that it was a problem that needed to be solved. And there's a couple of things with these surgeries that feel important to point out. One, yes, there are some operations related to intersex conditions that are key for health reasons, like opening up the urethra if the hole is a bit too small. But the vast majority are unnecessary, especially at such an early stage. And two, scar tissue develops very differently to other healthy tissue. So it's not like one surgery happens and boop, that's it. The child is going to experience more pain and more discomfort as they grow up. Now, I know I said I wouldn't go into this in too much detail, Tell, but there are interesting parallels with the trans community here, especially in regards to gender affirming care. I didn't word this properly when I recorded the original video, so here I am. The parallel is that choice is removed for both intersex and trans people, but kind of with contradicting rationales. For intersex people, their choice is removed by enforcing surgeries on them. For trans people, their choices are ignored because it's a big decision that they don't want to regret. And this can even happen when they are really certain in the decision and are old enough to make it for themselves. This leaves the obvious question, if surgeries are a big decision that needs to be taken carefully, why is that choice being removed from intersex people before they can even have a say, before they can physically speak? Pick a lane. It's like the doctors or society's desire for clean cut dividing lines far overrides the wants and needs of the actual person. It's like it isn't about what's best for the person at all, but rather about enforcing perceived norms. There's a lot to unpack here that I'll do another time, but I just found that too striking to ignore. So to go back to intersex people, there's a truly brilliant TED talk from Emily Quinn that I've linked below. And in it, she says that most of her intersex friends have had operations and that it's rare to meet an intersex person who hasn't been operated on or lied to about their body. She talks about someone who only found out that they were intersex when they were 41. That would be one thing, but this person's doctors had known since she was 15. And they even lied to her at one point and said that she had cancer. Even if you avoid the operations and, the, and potentially the lies, you still face constant probing questions about your body and invasions of your intimate space. 
Emily has a vagina but no uterus and internal testes. So she has testes inside of her where some people would have ovaries. She's had doctors insist that she gets these testes removed even though there is no need to. And another doctor told her that she needed surgery on her vagina otherwise she wouldn't be able to have a normal sex with her husband. And Emily Riley tells us that her sex life is just fine. So despite saying no to these operations they continue to be pushed on her. And isn't it wild how people's discomfort with things outside the binary ends up having a far worse psychological impact than if we lived in a society where people could just stay the way they were born. These aren't life-saving surgeries, they're forced aesthetically driven mutilations. And if you truly want someone to be happy and safe then let them choose if they have the operations or not and listen to their choice. Okay so these situations are without doubt horrendous but aren't they quite rare? In terms of considering intersex people and recognising sex as a spectrum when we talk about it, is it really worth bothering? There aren't that many intersex people, right? Let's make one thing clear. Even if there were barely any intersex people in the world, they are still people and deserve respect and acceptance for who they are. Just wanted to say that flat out. But now let's look at the actual numbers. Back in 2000, it was predicted that about 1.7% of the population have an intersex trait. Estimates I saw online generally vary between 1-2%, to but sources cite this 1.7% value as coming from some of the most accurate data we have, so let's go with that one. There are caveats to consider here, right? Like for example, studies are done with particular populations, so that percentage may not apply to the whole world, but let's say it averaged out, and again, let's go with it for now. This would mean there's a global population of over 136 million intersex people. That's about twice the total population of the UK. I said that in a posh way, just to emphasise the UK, total population. Now again, that 1.7 value picks up further criticism because it uses the most wide-ranging definition of intersex, so it includes changes that may go by unnoticed, like the triple sex chromosomes. So let's see what happens if we slim that percentage down. When we only count people who have clinically identifiable sexual variation, the estimate is more around 0.5%. This feels like a lot less, but on a global scale, that would still be around 40 million people. That's about the population of Canada. And you don't see us ignoring the rights of Canadians, do you? Even the lowest estimation I saw online, which is that 0.018% of the population are intersex, would still mean there are over 14.6 million intersex people in the world. That's similar to the population of Zimbabwe, for crying out loud. Being intersex is not super rare. But one reason we may underestimate how common it is is because many people never discover that they are, unless they seek help for infertility, or they have some other brush with medicine that accidentally reveals it. Like there's one report where surgeons operated on a hernia in a man, and whilst they were there, discovered he had a uterus. He was 70, he'd fathered four children, and it was just like, Surprise womb! My point is, biology, medical reports and anecdotal evidence all show that there are tons of intersex people out there. Some who are fully aware of their identity, some who don't know as it was hidden from them at birth, and some who don't know because it has so little impact on them. And honestly, my biggest recommendation is just that you go and watch videos of intersex people talking about their experiences. There are the brilliant ones that I've already mentioned so far, like the Anthony Padilla video or Emily Quinn's TED talk. And there's also one of my favourite ones which comes from Lad Bible and features the outrageously charismatic Rashante Anderson. And uh, yeah, I love it. So um, yeah. So why are we still saying that sex is binary? Well, ignoring any political reasons, in terms of the biology, it's just simpler to say. And when we want to get an idea across to people, anyone at any level, it's easier to simplify things. But it doesn't take much time to just add in a qualifying statement there. For example, you could say, in most cases, XX chromosomes lead to female physiology and XY male physiology. But there are many examples where this isn't the case or where people don't even have two sex chromosomes. Didn't take too long and is far more accurate. Thank you for taking my biology class. Your next lesson is going to be on how to make a science video and your listening material is going to be my new podcast hosted on Nebula. So I don't know if you know Simon Clark, climate scientist, lovely bloke. He and I have just released a podcast where we talk to top science creators about how they do their jobs, how they got to where they are, and importantly, how they make their videos. We go through everything from choosing a style, picking an audience, to whether or not they read the comments religiously afterwards. Guests include Streamy Award winner Tear Zoo, the dryly hilarious Rowan Francis from Medlife Crisis, the legend that is Sabrina Cruz from Answer in Progress, and only bloody Simone Yetch. 
who I was so flustered to talk to. Oh my God. The episodes are going up one a week, wherever you get your podcasts. But if you want, you can access the whole series ad-free at this very second on Nebula. Nebula is a streaming service set up by tons of creators like these legends um, who make thoughtful or educational stuff. On Nebula, you can watch exclusive content that was made just for there. So for example, in the past, I've done charades with my girlfriend and I've talked about a very not safe for work paper. There's quite the range. Plus, all my videos and everyone else's on there are ad-free, so they have no sponsor bits like this and no ads like YouTube ads. Watching on Nebula supports those of us who are a part of it and the creator-driven community that we're building there. And if you sign up using my link, you get a 40% discount on an annual plan. That means you can get access to Nebula for a year for $30. That's quick maths. 250 a month. Also for September only, we're offering lifetime memberships for $300. So if that floats your boat, go for it also, amigo. For the different sign up options, go to my link, which is go.nebula.tv slash sofsnotes. That link is in the description. It really helps me out if you sign up using my link. And also give me a shout if you listen to the podcast, tell me what you think. I really appreciate it. Although maybe don't tell me how much of a fangirl I sound in the Simone episode, because trust me, I know. <laughs> that is it for now though, everyone. Please do like this video if you like it, share it if you share it, subscribe it if you subscribe it, and comment with any thoughts that you have on this whole thing, or any experience you have of being intersex or intersexuality. Otherwise, all that's left to say is thank you so much for watching, have a lovely day, and remember, there's more to biology than meets the eye in a biology class. I've done, I've done better, I've done better, okay. Here's a list of legends. It's my patrons. Thank you so much for your support, patrons. I really appreciate it. And hello there, Drove and Puzlius. Good morning, everyone. I'm s oh, no. <laughs> I'm notes. <laughs> this is my stove. Complex science is intelligent, Lucy. Okay. Mark, I need a pee. So hopefully this is gonna help me really be eerily, really familiar. Really, really eerily familiar. Clearly, X Y. I don't know why I keep doing this. Na -na 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 -na. I don't know, it's like, I just can't help it. Is it not common though? Is it not common? Out! Out, damn outtake! It's the end screen and this video is long enough so I'm not gonna ramble. Like I'm trapped in a bramble. That doesn't make any sense. Do you have brambles in the States? I wonder how many of my viewers get here, you know? If you have got here, tell me if you know what a bramble is. <laughs> God, that literally was a ramble. Anyway, there's a video of myself, there's a playlist of my videos, and there's a patron link. Bye. Oh my God, my tummy is so loud.